All right, excellent. So good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, one of the uh, few remaining uh, lectures on fish taxonomy. I think we've got one or two more left after this, and then we're going to move into systems. And so again, we're, we're now talking about the advanced fishes. And so this is a lecture 11. And so uh, the first family we'll talk about this afternoon is family Pomatomidae. Pomatomidae. Again, we're in a, the advanced fishes, order Perciformes, family Pomatomidae, the bluefish. And so here's your example of Pomatomus saltatrix. This is the bluefish. Uh, again, this is uh, one of those fishes that you'll need to know for the laboratory portion of the class, I believe. And so this is your example fish there for the lab. And so for the lecture, family Pomatomidae. Two uh, key features here, the dorsal fins are separate. So you have your anterior dorsal fin and your posterior dorsal fin. And of course, as usual, the anterior dorsal fin in this group is going to be hard spines. Posterior dorsal fin is going to be soft rays. Uh, a key feature here is the soft dorsal fin and the anal fins actually have scales on them, which is kind of unusual. Normally there's just a, a webbing here on the rays, but these, the, the, the family Pomatomidae have scales on the anal fin and the soft dorsal fin. So that's a key feature. There's also this black blotch here at the base of the pectoral fin. And so you can see it down here in this uh, photograph. Large forked caudal fin. And so what this indicates is these fish swim pretty fast. Uh, they're very agile, uh, very maneuverable in the water, and very, uh, very quick at swimming. Uh, and that's a key feature there, that fork caudal fin. Three species in family Pomatomidae. These are all broadcast spawners. Males and females release their gametes into the water. Fertilization occurs uh, uh, outside of the body, in the water column. No parental care. So the, the fertilized embryos then just float away, and, and hopefully they survive. It's a very common uh, reproductive strategy here amongst fishes. Pomatomidae, bluefish, are valued commercially and as a recreational fish. Uh, people go out and catch these things a lot. Um, diet, strictly carnivorous. They eat squid, shrimp, crabs, and other fishes. So they're carnivores. And you can sort of see here they've got pretty prominent teeth. Family, worldwide coastal marine, tropic, and temperate sea distribution. So very widespread globally as far as the, uh, the family. When we look at the bluefish, Pomatomus saltatrix, widely known as a pelagic schooling fish and a voracious predator on other schooling fish like menhaden. And we talked about the importance of menhaden in the food webs. Well, this is an example of a predator uh, who uses menhaden as a prey base. Both jaws have rows of very sharp triangular teeth. Look at these. Very sharp triangular teeth. Uh, and in some cases, they're serrated. And so these are cutting teeth. And so these things uh, go through and bite stuff apart. And so a lot of times when they attack as a school, they end up just biting and tearing stuff apart. And oftentimes they, they, they kill more things than they actually eat. So there's, they'll swim against the school of, of Manhattan, for instance, and start chewing them up. And there's chunks of Manhattan floating all around, some of which they eat, some of which they don't. Sometimes it's been reported that they'll even attack humans if associated with a feeding frenzy in a school. Uh, they migrate north to south along the Atlantic coast, uh, following that these schools of bait fish such as Manhattan. Largest in the family is about 45 inches, 27 pounds. So they can get relatively big, but they're not like, uh, they're not dangerous. Pelagic larvae, again, external and fertilization, these pelagic larvae that are spawned when they hatch, they do so south of Cape Hatteras, and then they're advected northward into the middle Atlantic bite by the Gulf Stream and frontal eddies, <clears throat> and then they return then south as juveniles once they've metamorphosed. So the larvae get carried north, and then they uh, then swim back down south. So that is family Pomatomidae, the bluefish. The next group here, family Rachycentridae. Rachycentridae, not Turdae, Rachycentridae, R-I. These are the cobias. 
And so here is your example here, Rapicentron canatum, again, the cobia. Uh, it's an important food fish. Also, they've tried culturing these things in aquaculture, and, and there's actually aquaculture of cobia in uh, places outside of the United States. They've tried culturing it in, in, in the United States as well. Elongated head. So look at this very long, kind of sloping head, and it's flat. Uh, also kind of an elongated body. Dorsal spines are short, and they're not connected by a fin membrane. So the dorsal spines, they're here, they're hard spines, but they're not really a fin, they're sort of separate. And then here again is our soft rayed dorsal fin posterior, and then these anterior hard spines, not connected by fin membranes. Long sort uh, dorsal and anal fin. So look how long this soft dorsal fin is and also how long the anal fin is going all the way up here into the caudal peduncle. That's a key feature. The caudal fin is forked. Again, cobia can swim very well. So family Rachocentridae are very good swimmers. Adult, adult is countershaded. Now, when we talk about body pigmentation of fishes later, when we talk about biology, countershading is a very classical uh, strategy amongst a lot of pelagic open water fishes. It's a form of camouflage where the dorsal aspect of the fish is a dark color and the ventral aspect is a lighter color. And what this means is, is when the sun is shining down, like in this picture here, uh, the sun is shining down. You see how bright it is here? The, the, the ventral aspect being light sort of blends in. And so predators attacking from below have a hard time differentiating these things. And likewise, light shining down from above, if the predator is coming from the top down, the bottom of the ocean also appears dark. And so it's a form of count, uh, camouflage for above and below. These are broadcast spawners, again, releasing their gametes, uh, external fertilization, no parental care, maximum size about five feet, 150 pounds. And they're popular recreational species, so people go out and catch cobia. They're associated with drift lines, flotsam, and also sometimes they'll hang around manta rays. And this may be for protection. Uh, the manta ray is pretty big. They can sort of hang around underneath it. Um, and the manta ray is not really, is, it's not really going to eat anything. I mean, they're planktivores, but they uh, are a very kind of large, maybe impressive looking thing and so other stuff might not want to mess with them when they're associated with this so maybe for protection these things cobia typically eat other fish so they're piscivores family pelagic coastal marine in the atlantic indian and pacific oceans so again very widespread family and you're going to see this with a lot of these persiforms uh they're very successful again light armor fast swimming agile very good jaws uh, apex predators kind of thing. Very successful form. And so family Rachocentridae, the cobias. Next family, Echinidae. Echinidae, the remoras. And I know that you have to know this one for the lab. Echinidae's family, Echinidae, the remoras. Now, these things are pretty simple. I mean, you can look at these other features here. I'm going to go ahead and say flat head, elongated body with a flat head that has a cephalic suck, sucking disc. All right. This is a modified dorsal fin. So the modified dorsal fin is split into 10 to 28 traverse movable lamellae that are inside of this membranous sort of disc they can actually form suction to attach to hosts, like this shark here, or for instance, uh, the shell of a sea turtle. So they can physically attach to other fish or turtles. Uh, no spines are in the dorsal fin, so that's a key feature because it's got a cephalic sucking disc. Uh, there's also no spines in the anal fin, which is kind of unusual because most persiforms have this. They have spines there in the anal fin. Uh, there's eight species of remoras in family Echinidae, uh, broadcast spawners. They do not have parental care. Fertilization occurs outside of the body. Max length, about three and a half feet. And they're opportunistic feeders on parasitic copepods. 
so for instance, if, if, a, if a fish has uh, parasites on it, the remoras will actually clean those parasites off. They also will eat food scraps. Uh, for instance, if a shark is attacking something and uh, small bits of fish are uh, left behind, the remoras will detach and eat those and then swim back and reattach to the shark. Don't, they can also filter feed on some zooplankton and they can also help take care. For instance, they'll, they'll feed on sloughing epidermal tissue. And also in some cases, they might eat the feces of, of, of this. I, I wouldn't call it a host because they're not really parasites. They perform sort of a, a service here. So they're not parasites. They just sort of hang around for a ride and uh, help clean the animal up. Family, worldwide coastal tropic temperate sea distribution. They're all marine. There are no freshwater remoras. They're all marine. So family Echinidae, the remoras, very characteristic here and a very uh, interesting life history here of attaching to other aquatic organisms. This is one of my other favorite families of fishes. I know I've said that a lot, but I do like family Corophanidae, the dolphin. Uh, some people like to call these dolphin fishes so that they're not to be confused with like bottlenose dolphins, things like that, but really they're dolphin. Uh, also, people call them dolphin fishes because they're a popular food fish. You know, a lot of people eat these. And when you go to a restaurant, you know, uh, most people, if they see dolphin on the menu, are not going to order it. So maybe they can put dolphin fish on there. And because of that, there's also other names. So most people might recognize it as mahi mahi, like in a restaurant or in the grocery store. Uh, and they call uh, mahi mahi is a Hawaiian word for this particular fish. They also call it dorado in Spanish speaking countries and also on the West Coast. So like in California, these are dorado. And it's because the males have this bright yellow color, like gold, like the dorado. So they're called Dorado, Mahi, Dolphin, Dolphin Fish. Now you can understand where we're gonna call it Corophanidae is the family because these common names get kind of confusing. Key features, long continuous dorsal fin that starts here in the head, it goes all the way back to the caudal peduncle. No spines in the dorsal fin, no spines in the anal fin. Uh, again, kind of an un a unique characteristic for family per Persiformes. Uh, because they don't, they, most of them have spiny dorsal fins to aid in protection. Caudal fin, deeply forked. These things are very good swimmers. And maybe the reason why they don't need spines is they can swim up to 40 miles an hour. And so they can, they can really outswim a lot of stuff. They're very fast. Two species in family Corophanidae, broadcast spawners, external fertilization, no parental care. Max size, five foot, 88 pounds. And these things grow rapidly. I'm gonna show a video here. These things, they can reach a, a very large size in about two or three years. So a very fast growing fish. Excellent food fish, excellent sport, sport fish. People go out catching these things a lot. Very popular in restaurants. You know, people go to fancy seafood places and what do they order mahi? The males are called bulls. They have this very kind of steep head, this forehead here. And it's really an expansion of the super occipital bone of the skull. So they're, I guess they're hard headed, if you will. Both sexes are brilliantly colored. The females are more of a, of a dark to a light blue, whereas the males are like a bluish to greenish and then a bright, vibrant yellow. Can prey on flying fish. You know, so we talked about how flying fish in the family today leap out of the water to avoid predation as a defense mechanism. Well, guess what? The mahi can leap 10 to 15 feet out of the water after a flying fish to eat it. So mahi can jump. And again, they're very fast swimming. Family, oceanic worldwide marine tropics. These things are pretty much all over the world in tropics. Uh, that they, they really are very widely distributed. Again, uh, very successful group of fishes here, very successful. So with that, I'll show you this video here of, of Mahi. And I just wanna make sure that, uh, yes, my sharing of computer sound is on. 
So here are the dolphin fish, Coriophanidae. Dolphin are probably would have to be one of the most common pelagic fishes in the world. They're found basically anywhere where you get surface temperatures above 70 degrees in, in clear oceanic water. They're also a very beautiful fish. They uh, have a variety of different color patterns, but it's all very, very vivid. Dolphin also happen to be one fish that you actually can tell males from females. They're sexually dimorphic. Males actually get larger than females, but in addition to that, they have a characteristic blunt forehead that allows you to really differentiate between males and females. Like all other fish, or animals in general really, they're meant to do two things, eat and reproduce. But in the case of dolphin, they do everything at an accelerated pace. Dolphin have to be one of the fastest growing fishes known to mankind. They've been recorded to grow as much as almost three inches per week. And a dolphin that spawned in a year, within its first year, can reach almost four feet and 40 pounds. So they grow extremely, extremely fast. As I said, males generally grow faster and get to larger sizes than uh, females. Females generally top out around 40 pounds, while males routinely exceed 60 pounds. They also reproduce at an incredibly young age. Uh, within just a few months, three months old, they may be reproducing. And that's a fish that's only 14 inches in length. So they're eating fast and reproducing at a very early age. Consequently, if you've got all that on your mind, you're probably not thinking about other things too much. And their natural mortality is quite high to boot. Uh, it's estimated that probably close to 99% of all dolphins that spawn in a given year die due to predators and, and other factors. They're a very short-lived species, three to four years max. Most of the fish that anglers are catching are probably year one fish or, or one year old and uh, a two-year-old fish is considered uh, very, very old. These fish move around a lot and they've been recorded to travel up to 800 miles within 10 days. You typically find dolphin in very clear offshore water. It doesn't have to be very far from shore, but anywhere you have deep, clear water. And they're often associated with floating material. Uh, natural stuff like sargassum lines that have a lot of natural bait and fishes there attract them, as well as things that have just been discarded off ships and trash even, uh, they'll be associated. When they're smaller, they generally congregate in big schools, but as they increase in size, they generally travel in increasingly smaller and smaller schools, and, and the very biggest males will generally be solitary. Dolphin, because they're found in so many different places, have a lot of different local colloquial names. Here in Florida, we call them dolphin. The west coast are called uh, dorado, which uh, alludes to their golden color. In Hawaii, they're mahi-mahi. Um, any place you find them, people have a different name, but they are all esteemed by anglers because they fight hard. They're beautiful fish and they taste really good too. There's two main ways that people generally fish for dolphin. One involves trolling, fairly high speed trolling with baits or generally um, artificial lures. The other is a run and gun where you may be scanning the ocean for debris on the surface or also looking for birds. Uh, frigate birds in general are a big clue that uh, you may have dolphin and big dolphin at that in the area. So anglers will generally switch up between those two different ways. If you find a school of small fish, generally speaking, you can keep them around the boat as long as you keep one fish in the water that's hooked. Uh, these fish are not very smart and once you hook one fish up, you can generally catch most of the fish in the school, which is in why it's important to be conservation minded and only take what you need and throw the rest back in pretty good shape. So, family Coriophanidae, uh, the dolphin. Uh, you know, one of the interesting things about this is because of those biological characteristics, very fast growing, very successful uh, at early reproduction, things like that. This is actually a great example of a good fishery that, I mean, human beings can always overfish stuff, but these things are actually very robust. Uh, it's a very robust fishery. The, the, the biology of these animals uh, can tolerate quite a bit of pressure. So uh, that's another example there of a, of a good fishery. So Coriphanidae. Family Carangidae, the jacks. Very uh, compressed body, uh, but they can vary from a deep body uh, 
deep meaning a uh, very kind of like round almost to a uh, fusiform uh, uh, like this here. Fast corangiform swimming. When we talk about swimming styles, we'll talk about what that is. But again, deeply forked caudal fin. You know this fish is fast, very narrow caudal peduncle. Uh, this fish has a lot of power behind it when it swims. So they're very fast. Two separate dorsal fins uh, in the adults. Uh, lateral line scales are modified sometimes into bony plates or scutes. So like you can sort of see these uh, bony plates here. So they got a little bit of armor up here. The pectoral fins are sometimes wing-like. So you can see how long and wing-like this pectoral fin is in some species. The first two anal, spin, uh, anal spines in the anal fin are detached, meaning that they're just loose anal spines. And then the uh, anal spine three through the rest of them then are attached with fin webbing. Caudal fin is forked, very narrow caudal peduncle. All right, whether it's a deep bodied or fusiform type, they have that very narrow caudal peduncle, very deeply forked tail. Coloration is mostly kind of a brilliant silver. And this is also another form of camouflage in the open pelagic waters uh, as they reflect light. 140 species, broadcast spawners, external fertilization, no parental care, max size, five foot, 175 pounds. Most are coast, coastal or oceanic uh, open water schooling. Uh, they prey on other fishes, so they are predators. Family worldwide marine, some species, uh, juveniles will live in estuaries, but mostly they're marine. Tropical, uh, temperate, uh, warm temperate seas, so warmer, warm, warmer water species, so family Carangidae. And here are some examples, again, that you might need to know for class. The Atlantic bumper fish has a very convex belly. It's very round kind of belly, large eye. Not very large, they're 12 inches, but again, predators. Uh, the Florida pompano, Trachonitis uh, carolinus, excellent food fish. You know, this is a very good eating fish. A lot of times people, one of my favorite ways to cook this is whole. You just gut it and you scale them and you just eat them whole. Uh, grilled or broiled, very good fish, the pompano. Look down, Celine Vomer. Look at this head, very kind of sloping head, mouth set very low and the eye set very high. And the overall profile is almost that the head is kind of concave, deep body. But again, narrow caudal peduncle. All these fish have that deeply forked caudal fin. The greater amberjack, genus Seriola, prized, <clears throat> prized sport fish. Uh, fishermen very power, like to catch these very powerful fish can be quite large, over 150 pounds. So uh, greater amberjack, Seriola dumeruli, uh, the amberjack. So those are some examples there uh, of the family Carangidae. Now moving into family Lutejanidae. Uh, here is our example, the red snapper, Lutejanus. Uh, Capricanus, continuous dorsal fin, continuous dorsal fin, anterior hard spines, posterior soft rays. So we're getting back into that trend with Persiforms. Two, one to two enlarged canine teeth here in the mouth. Uh, caudal fin can be truncated or emarginated, too deeply forked. So here's a forked caudal fin here. Here is an e, uh, emarginated caudal fin here. 125 species in family Lutejanidae, broadcast spawners, maximum size five feet, 125 pounds, highly valued food fish sought by commercial and recreational fishermen. Snappers are generally uh, the medium to large apex predators on coral reefs. Uh, they're active at night and during crepuscular periods. This is an interesting word, crepuscular. This means times when it's not quite light but it's not quite dark so dawn and dusk uh, you hear a lot of fishermen talk about going out to catch fish during dawn or dusk because it's the best time to catch fish and we'll talk more about that when we talk about behavior of fish but the term for that is crepuscular activity family worldwide marine distribution some species have juveniles and estuaries really again tropical uh, warm temperate waters so very good food fish, very popular in restaurants. 
Stanley Lujanide, the Snappers. Uh, a couple of different uh, ecological groups here. Midwater foragers on plankton, for instance, the vermilion snapper here, rhomboplites, uh, aurorubens, uh, most abundant snapper off the coast of North Carolina. Populations recently, though, are considered stressed due to a little bit of overfishing. Uh, max length, two feet, about six pounds. And again, kind of a, a pinkish red color, very pretty fish. Fusiform body. Then there are benthic piscivorous snappers, for instance, the red snapper here. Uh, deeper, kind of heavier body. Uh, these are overfished and they're kind of uncommon off the coast of North Carolina. Max size is about three feet, 35 pounds. Again, very good eating fish. Uh, young, are, uh, young adults are red, of red snapper. Uh, note the diffuse spot most commonly associated here with the lateral line um, in young adults. And these things also may associate with artificial reefs off of North Carolina. So they sort of uh, associate with structure. So family Lugenidae, the snappers. Uh, another family here, Hamulidae, the grunts, Hamulidae. Now here's the white grunt, Hamulon plumeri. Continuous dorsal fin, again, anterior hard spines, posterior soft rays, keeping with the trend, persiforms. Small mouth uh, with very small teeth, all right? They have large molars or molar-form teeth on these very powerful pharyngeal jaws that they use to crush things inside of their head. So kind of like small teeth on the oral jaw, but very powerful pharyngeal jaws. And that sort of gives you an idea. These things are eating crustaceans and mollusks, things with shells, so their jaws in the head are designed to pulverize these things. They'll also eat other small fish. They can grind these pharyngeal jaws together to produce a grunting or grinding sound. So some fishes will vibrate the swim bladder. These things will literally grind their teeth, so to speak, and then amplify that sound using their swim bladder or their air bladder. And I'll show, a, I'll play a sound of that here in a minute. 150 species, broadcast spawning, no parental care, or, uh, external fertilization. Uh, family worldwide distribution, tropical, warm, temperate coral reefs. Uh, many in estuaries, but rarely do you find family Hamulidae uh, in freshwater. So here is the sounds of stridulation. And so this is uh, ocean conservation research. Here's the bar grunt. There's some information about it, but down here they've got audiographs and we can listen to then the stridulation. And so that is a grunting noise again, made by grinding the pharyngeal teeth. Uh, grinding the pharyngeal teeth and then amplifying that noise with the swim bladder. So very kind of interesting there. These are your key features, family Hamulidae. Some, uh, the next family here, Sparidae, the Sparids or the Porgies. Here's the red Porgy, Pagris Pagris. Continuous dorsal fin. Uh, front jaw, had, the teeth are incisors and then, or canines, and the rar, the rar jaw, the, the, this is a typo, the rear jaw, the rear jaw teeth are molars. So similar to like the teeth in your head, the front teeth are incisors or canines meant for cutting or tearing, and the rear teeth in the oral jaw are meant for crushing stuff. And so this is a unique thing for fish. Most fish don't have this. This this, this is, having different types of teeth in your head is called heterodont. Hetero meaning different. Dont, like dentist, dent, is, diff, uh, is tooth. So this means, heterodont means different teeth, whereas most other fish have homodont, homo, same teeth. So all the teeth in most fish jaws are the same. These fish and family Sparidae have different teeth. They have heterodont teeth. The jaw teeth are powerful, uh, but they also have well-developed molar teeth 
also on the pharyngeal jaw. Again, a major advance in order persiformes. Advanced uh, pharyngeal jaws, again, used to crush and grind up shellfish. So uh, mollusks. Most porgies are omnivores, but some are herbivores, such as the pinfish, and again, some eat invertebrates like shellfish. Hermaphroditism is common uh, in the family of Sparidae. Both protogeny, proto first, gene, woman, and proto first, andry, man. So sometimes they're females first and then switch to males. Other times they're males first and then switch to females. So they can go uh, either way. 100 species, broadcast spawners. Uh, most species, uh, two old world species, the male digs a circular nest in a sandy bottom where they lay these adhesive eggs that stick into clumps. <clears throat> and the female deposits them, the, the, the eggs there, and then the male will fertilize those eggs and then guard the nest. So uh, mostly broadcast spawners. Family worldwide marine. Young can sometimes hatch in, fresh, uh, in estuaries, but rarely are they found in freshwater. Again, tropical, warm temperate region distribution. So pretty wide distribution in, uh, in marine areas. So when we talk about heterodont dentition and, and some examples of sparids, we got spot-tailed uh, pinfish here, uh, locally called the ringtail, uh, prot protandrous hermaphrodite. So again, male first, then switching to female. Here's the pinfish, Legodon uh, rhomboids. The first dark shoulder spot here is a key feature and also they have what's called an antrous spine. Now, anyone who's caught these things, when you go to take, if you're going to hold on to them to take the hook out of their mouth, the first dorsal spine is loose. There's no webbing there and it points forward. It's the pin of the pinfish. So when it happens is you grab a hold of this thing and that spine pokes you in the hand, hence the name pinfish. The sheep's head is the largest porgy in North Carolina at three foot 20 pounds. And then when we talk about heterodont teeth, these are the interesting jaws. Look at this. These front teeth are like incisors and canines, and then you've got these molar teeth here in the rear of the jaw. They, they literally, it's kind of creepy looking. Look at the jaws of these fish. But this is the skull of that fish. And this is heterodont dentition, different types of teeth in the jaw. So heterodont dentition, a key feature, key feature. Next group, family cyanidae, the drums. Deeply notched, long dorsal fin. So again, very deeply notched dorsal fin here. And then the, the posterior dorsal fin is pretty long. Again, going all the way back to the caudal peduncle. The mouth is kind of subterminal. And many have a single, or in some cases, a patch of chin barbells. And again, we call these mental barbells when they're on the chin. So barbells on the chin. Lateral line extends all the way from here down the side of the fish and through into the caudal fin. Well-developed swim bladder in most species. They can vocalize by making drumming sounds by vibrating the air bladder. So these things vibrate the swim bladder to make drumming noises. 270 species, broadcast spawners, external fertilization, uh, no parental care, max size, six feet, 300 pounds in the endangered Mexican Totoaba. And I'll show you a video here of Totoaba. Diet, typically fish, crabs, and shrimp. Family, worldwide marine estuaries, freshwater, tropics, and marine temperate regions. Family cyanidae, they can be found all over the place. So marine, estuaries, and freshwater, very widely distributed, very successful kind of family. And so here are some of the, the sounds of a black drum, what they make. So here is the, uh, oop, here is the stridulation there of the black drum. <laughs> So that's a drumming noise. So the black drum makes that noise. So what I'm going to show you here next is then this article about Totoaba. And so this is my, my bato, my buddy from Mexico, Canal True. He's a professor at the Autonomous University Baja, Mexico, right south of San Diego. He's right in northern Mexico. 
And this is when I graduated with my PhD. And so Kanal was there at my graduation ceremony. He's a good friend of mine. Look at, he's giving me the, the ears. <laughs> so Kanal is a good guy. So this is a news article about Kanal because his research is on Totoava. And I helped him with some of his PhD work. In particular, uh, he was looking at spawning Totoava in captivity. And so we're looking at characterizing the egg yolk and reproductive system of Totoaba. That was his PhD research. And so when he was doing PhD research. And so let me see if I can reload this article here. There, small hatchery helping the endangered iconic Totoaba making a comeback. And so here's Canal talking about this. Totoaba is a large, 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 large croaker. It uh, is an endemic species to the Sea of Cortes. It has relatively relatives uh, that people could relate to, like uh, red drum in Texas, like white sea bass here in California. Uh, there's another fish uh, in Asia, which is called Mulloway. All of them are from the croaker family, and croakers have the characteristic that they can uh, make unique sounds with their swim bladder. Males develop a muscle that lines their swim bladder and they can stroke it and they can make drumming sounds or they can make croaking sounds or they can make purring sounds, different kinds that they use basically during uh, mating season to bring in courtship. These baby totuabas uh, we've been releasing into the wild and somehow we need to track them. We need to make sure that we know who they are and that they are different from the fish that are in the wild. We were the first facility to bring Totoaba into captivity. Then we had to figure out how to get them to continue on and spawn and reproduce. Then follow up with all the larval rearing going basically from fertile eggs uh, through all life stages and develop a small juvenile. Uh, originally we could only get one spawn per female and she would not spawn only once and she wouldn't spawn until the following year. When we looked at uh, a sample under the microscope, we could see that there was not only one lot of eggs, but there were several, but she would only spawn one. She would only ovulate one. It turns out that they're missing out the some kind of hormo hormonal cue. So developed the procedures to make specific kind of implants and now we have them spawning at least five to seven times consecutive days um, during spawning season. The ultimate end, the idea is to get back the use of the species because there's a tremendous value behind it. And the other thing is that there's a lot of fishermen in the Sea of Cortes that are not allowed to fish anymore for other reasons and conservation for other species like Baquita. So I think that's part of the goal of the project, really to understand the natural population, to keep, continue on the restocking, and ultimately get back some kind of regulated use out of the fishery. That is Kanal uh, talking about Totoava. And when he's talking about those implants, that's sort of what we helped him develop with the uh, hormone implants to spawn the fish. Very interesting, the Totoava. Some other examples uh, of the family Cyanidae. Cyanops oscillatus. Oscillatus because of the spot right here on the tail. This is the North Carolina state fish, the red drum. Also called puppy drum, channel bass, red fish, spot tailed drum. Lots of different common names here. North Carolina status here is uh, considered stressed and declining. Size, five foot, 90 pounds. You know, there's a 18 to 27 inch total length slot limit, I believe right now in the state. Um, and you have to know this fish, of course, for your laboratory portion of the course. It is the state fish for North Carolina. The jackknife fish uh, is a very interesting one here. Associates with coral reefs, whereas most drums occur over soft substrates. This drum here has sharply contrasting black and white stripes. Uh, they go all the way through the, the, the dorsal fin. 
And look, at there's an eye bar here through the eye to camouflage it. So very interesting coloration patterns here. Kind of confusing camouflage, if you will. So a lot of fish, if they don't recognize it or don't understand it, they just don't want to eat it. So a lot of times camouflage is designed to confuse things. And so with that being said, these kind of camouflage patterns lead us into the next family, family Catodontidae, the butterfly fishes. Uh, these things have unique characteristics, oftentimes laterally compressed bodies. They're very thin, but very deep bodied as well. So they're almost round and very pancake-like. They have a sp they do, uh, spine at the uh, preoper operculum is absent. So we're gonna talk about another family here in a minute that has a preoperculum spine that looks similar. These things do not have any spines on the preoperculum. Dorsal fin is continuous. Small terminal protractile jaws with needle or bristle-like teeth. They feed on coral polyps and other invertebrates on coral reefs. They, all, they have an eye band that conceals the eye. So all these have an eye band through the eye to help uh, conceal it. And then oftentimes they have, an, again, an ocellus. Ocellus is a fake eye. And so it looks like the eye is here on this fish, but really the eye is here. And so again, this is designed to confuse predators. Like which end is the, the eating end of this fish or which end is swimming away from me? It's sort of hard to tell. 114 species, broadcast spawners, max length uh, eight inches. Because these things are quite brilliantly colored, they're very popular marine aquarium fishes. So they're very brilliantly colored, very pretty fish. Uh, family worldwide marine tropic, warm sea and warm temperate sea distribution. So pretty warm water fish here. Uh, very brilliantly colored. Family Cato Dont today, the butterfly fishes. Uh, some species, for instance, the four-eyed butterfly fish, have this ocellus, which again confuses predators, also can assist in uh, male-female pair bonding. And so a lot of times these things do pair bonding uh, long term, four to five years, they'll find a mate. Um, and so these things uh, use it for species recognition, for instance, or for individual recognition. Most species, again, brightly, brilliantly colored, uh, they have heavy bony plates sometimes on the head and body for some extra protection. And really, when you look at these things, the abundance and diversity of family today is often used as an indicator of general health of coral reefs. So when we look at concepts like index of biotic integrity or things like that, we're looking at species diversity or in enrichment indices. Really, family today is an oftentimes important bioindicator group. So looking at the health of coral reefs, family Catodontidae. Very interesting groups. Uh, Pomacanthidae, the angel fishes. Pomacanthidae. Uh, unlike family Catodontidae, these things have a spine on the preoperculum. Key diagnostic feature between Catodontidae and Pomacanthidae. Again, body is strongly compressed. They're very thin, kind of pancake-like, but very deep body. Dorsal fin is continuous. In some cases, there are these filament-like extensions uh, on the dorsal and anal fins of the adults. So filament-like extensions here on the dorsal and anal fins. Again, like family today, mouth is usually kind of small and terminal or protractile. Again, very brightly colored reef fish, feeds on a variety of different things, sponges, algae, small, other small organisms. 75 species, broadcast spawning, no parental care, or, uh, external fertilization, max length about 15 inches, and also important aquarium fishes because again, these things are quite brilliantly colored, very pretty fish. Family, worldwide marine, tropical and subtropical distribution, mostly associated with some kind of structure such as coral reefs. So these are uh, a, a, another important reef fish. An interesting fact about uh, family Pomacanthidae is that juveniles of the emperor uh, angelfish have a distinct and strikingly different color pattern from adults. So like, for instance, here is a juvenile and here's an adult. And so here's another, another example. 
juveniles and adults, juveniles and adults, quite different looking, almost like there are different species, different looking coloration patterns. And this is because the adults are very territorial. Uh, they will actually fight over grounds or territory or breeding. And uh, this is very aggressive behavior. And so the juvenile color patterns allow the, the, the adults then don't recognize them as conspecifics. And so the juveniles then don't get beaten to death by the adults. Uh, and so they've designed this, uh, and, and as they mature, then the coloration pattern will then mimic that of the adult. But when they're juveniles, they have this coloration that, that allows them to be distinguished from the adults so that there's no fighting amongst the parents and children, so to speak. So a very interesting fact there about family Pomacanthidae. Very territorial fish. These fish here are kind of goofy. Look at this thing here, the sea chub. Family Kyphosidae, oval-shaped body. Kind of an oval-shaped body here. Small terminal mouth with very like kind of small incisor-like teeth. And what these things do is they chop or trim or crop algae. And so they're uh, algae feeders. Intestine is very long and they actually have a cecum in there. They can ferment plants that they eat with bacterial fermentation. So this is a, an adaptation of the gut to aid in digestion and absorption of eating uh, algae. So they do hind gut fermentation, kind of like uh, ruminant terrestrial animals like cows. They ferment in the gut. Juveniles and adults associated with flotsam, for instance, sargassum, and we talked about the sargasso sea. They also associate the hull with the hull or rudder of ships. And so their other common name besides seed chub is the rudder fish. Adults usually form aggregations, sometimes above coral reefs, and again, associate with structure like this. About 42 species. Broadcast spawning, uh, we assume, we don't know for real, you know, not everything is known about all fishes. We're gonna guess that most fish do this so that the family Kyphosidae does the same. Max length is about a foot or so. I like this comment here, very poor food fish. Now, what happened is this, my guess. They're associated with ships, right? The hulls of ships. And my guess is that people coming across the ocean long distance traveling, might have run short on food, but there are these things swimming alongside the boat. They say, hey, let's go fish those things out and eat them. And then they go, oh my Lord, those are terrible. Don't eat that stuff. So my guess is that people tried to eat these things on long voyages, but just unpalatables from what I've heard. I've never tasted one, but that's, I guess, what the anecdote is. Family worldwide marine tropical temperate reef distribution. Family Kyphosidae the sea chubs or the rudder fish. So we're gonna move into a new suborder here, family Labroid Labroidii. Um, and some key features here generally, there's six families, 2,200 species. One of the largest suborders of fishes actually, lots of diversity here. And I'm gonna say primarily due to a couple key families. The families are united by similar pharyngeal jaw morphology. They've got pretty well-developed oral jaws, but very sophisticated pharyngeal jaws inside of the head. So again, uh, further advancements on this jaw, this feeding apparatus. All have very highly developed pharyngeal jaws, very diverse feeding strategies uh, and food handling abilities. And so we're looking here at things like the cichlids, uh, the surf perches, uh, the damselfishes, wrasses, kales, and the parrotfishes. And really the cichlids are an immensely diverse group, which we'll talk about here, family cichlidae. And again, the common name is cichlids, right? So it doesn't make that one hard to understand the family. Interrupted lateral line. So you see the lateral line starts here. It's all over the head, but it starts here at the preoperculum. It goes down the body to right about here right about where the hard spiny dorsal fin ends and the soft ray dorsal fin starts, that's where the lateral line stops. Singular pair of nostrils, much variability here in body morphology, size and shape. 1,300 species in family cichlidae, 
855 species endemic to African lakes alone, the Rift Lakes. And we'll talk about that at the end of this, the, the lecture. That's our story for this, this lecture. Maximum length, two and a half feet. Family is in freshwater, but also brackish water. A lot of these things are what we call urihale, like the uh, Nile tilapia can live in pretty salty water as well as fresh water. They're urihaline. They can tolerate freshwater and brackish water, like estuaries. Uh, New world and old world tropic and subtropical areas oftentimes are not cold water. These things are all mostly warm water fish, like Nile tilapia really can't tolerate. They don't really like it less than 65 degrees Fahrenheit. One species occurs in southern Texas. Many species occur as exotics in Florida. For instance, if they're brought over to America and they escape, they can be established in warm areas like Florida. So again, another reason to not let, 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 your, let your aquarium fish loose. Family cichlidic. They are what we call mouth brooders uh, and substrate spawners. The parental care is very substantial here on the eggs and the fry. So, the males or the, 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 the females will hold the eggs in their mouth until they hatch. And even after they hatch, then the larvae will hang around the mama's head. And if a predator comes by, she'll open her mouth and they'll all swim in her mouth for protection. It's kind of crazy. So I'm going to show a couple of videos here of the African cichlids to demonstrate this, but they're what we call a mouth brooder. So here are the mouth brooding fish, the cichlids of Lake Malawi, which is, again is one of those African rip lakes. Uh... Cichlids are beautiful fish that come in many colors and sizes. They can adapt quickly and expertly to a variety of microhabitats, and as a family, they are highly successful. One of the reasons for this success is that cichlids take care of their young. This behavior is highly unusual amongst fish, and it's absolutely fascinating. It's a week into the expedition, and the crew is actively searching for evidence of fish taking care of their young. In this case, a behavior called mouth brooding. Finding the right area is one thing, but being prepared to wait for a mouth brooder is another story. At the foot of the drop-off at Tumby Island, the fallen boulders provide the right habitat for Serenochromis mothers. This particular fish is alone with no brood following her. Staying with her for a while reveals that she's already thought about her batch of young and they're safe inside her mouth. Further along the drop-off, a shoal of fry is left to fend for itself. The little fish swim aimlessly and bigger cichlids begin to follow. As the opportunistic bigger fish close in, the fry try to escape. Even algae eaters will turn predatory if given the chance. A neighboring mother is far more diligent. She doesn't leave her brood for more than seconds at a time and constantly chases other fish out of the area. She tends closely to her fry and they mass around her mouth. When the 
threat becomes too great, the mother cichlid opens her mouth and allows the brood inside. It's obvious that this childcare strategy works well for this species. Although cichlids lay relatively fewer eggs than other species of fish, the energy they invest in caring for their young definitely pays off, giving them a much greater chance of surviving to adulthood. The empire of the cichlid embraces three continents, and this behavior is seen in cichlid habitats from Africa to Asia and here in South America. Back in the clear waters of Lake Malawi, there are more species of cichlids here than anywhere else on Earth. The water's visibility is also a reason they survive so successfully here. They are able to see potential mates, their offspring and predators easily. This vast, beautiful lake that David Livingstone referred to as the Lake of Stars is a natural treasure with World Heritage Site status. Its freshwater biodiversity is unrivaled and it supports not only the inhabitants of the lake, but the humans who live on its edge. This is a place worth protecting, especially for the extraordinary underwater inhabitants who rule this kingdom, the cichlids of Lake Malawi. The cichlids of Lake Malawi. Now here is an interesting video showing some of the, the courtship behavior of cichlid egg. Now, you know, the, you saw the mouth brooding, the females sort of protect the young and also hold the eggs in the mouth. The females also will produce a mucus in the oral cavity, the buccal cavity, that the juveniles will feed from in some species. Kind of like mammals, the females produce milk to nourish infants. Well, the, the female cichlids will produce a mucus in their mouths that the juveniles will feed from. And also there's very complicated courtship behaviors. And so this is a video showing some uh, behaviors of cichlids in an aquarium. very complicated and a lot of times uh, females will actually fight at each other like that intentionally trying to make uh, another female spit their uh, juveniles out of their mouth to eat them and so they'll sometimes attack each other as well uh, to, to, to sort of force them to release the, uh, uh, the juveniles. So that's some cichlid behavior. Family cichlidae, very unique family. Very diverse family as well. Fa family pomacentridae, pomacentridae, the damselfishes. The lateral line, kind of like family cichlidae, is interrupted or incomplete. So uh, it, it does not extend the entire length of the body. So for instance, it might start here and only come part way down uh, the side. So interrupted lateral line single pair of nostrils, single continuous dorsal fin, single continuous dorsal fin, uh, two spines in the anal fin. Most are uh, small and colorful, especially as juveniles, like for instance, this one here. Uh, adults tend to be kind of a more drab color. Mouth is small and most are benthic feeders on algae or invertebrates. Some uh, do feed on, their filter feeders on plankton. Um, 315 species in the family, they are substrate spawners. So what that means is, is uh, they will make a nest, a uh, female will come in, lay eggs on that nest, the male will then fertilize them, and then the male will guard that nest. So we're looking at a little bit, we're looking at parental care here among family Pomacentridae. 
Uh, one species, the male will continue to guard the fry. So the, the, the hatched fry will swim around the male and the male will guard them. So family worldwide uh, distribution, tropical warm temperate seas. So kind of warm water fish here. And I got a video then showing male damselfish uh, protecting this nest and, or digging this nest. And so here are the damselfishes spawning and protecting that nest. So I think it's the female, it's the, I'll see which one it is here first digging. stay there to guard the nest afterwards. So family Poma centridae. Also uh, in this group are the anemone fishes. Uh, so anemone fishes are family Poma centridae, you know, finding Nemo, this, this thing here. They have a symbiotic relationship with large sea anemones. Uh, in the Indo-Pacific Ocean. So about 30 species of anemone fishes, you know, some people call these clown fishes. Uh, and these fishes will associate with up to 10 different species of anemones. So they do this for protection. And so here's a video they're talking about the anemone fishes of, uh, as a group, uh, maybe their species within family Pomacentridae. So here are the anemone fishes. They would portrayal. I mean, other than the fact that they don't actually talk. But you may find these colorful little fish quite surprising. Join me on a dive to meet some real anemone fish. <sighs> anemone fish are found all over the tropical parts of the Indian and Pacific Oceans. They're quite common on coral reefs, so it won't take me too long to find one. Searching a reef on the Pacific island of Yap, I soon come across a pair of orange fin anemone fish, frolicking in an anemone that looks like a shag carpet. They're not afraid of me at all. I can swim right up and look them in the eye. There are 28 different species of anemone fish, all of which are very colorful, but the clown anemone fish, sometimes called the clown fish, is probably the most beautiful. This is the species that was the basis for the character in Finding Nemo. Anemone fish get their name because they live in a toxic anemone. This lush carpet has venomous tentacles that sting most fish. But the anemone fish is covered in a special slimy mucus that keeps the anemone from stinging it. Because of this adaptation, the anemone fish can live protected by the anemone, happily playing in the very tentacles that would kill other fish. Anemone fish are not the only animals that can live in the anemone. Cleaner shrimps hide here as well. They eat by cleaning the parasites from the fish, and in exchange for their services, the fish graciously don't eat the shrimp. But it's hard to relax when you're battered around by hyperactive anemone fish all day long. Protection afforded by the anemone is the reason why the anemone fish aren't afraid of me. They know that the anemone's stinging tentacles keep them safe. If another fish, like this damselfish, comes near the anemone, the anemone fish become territorial and chase it away. 
they protect their anemone just as much as the anemone protects them. So it's a good relationship. And if a fish gets too close, the anemone gets a meal using its venomous tentacles to sting and disable the fish. This fish is lunch. The anemone might look like some kind of weird plant, but it's actually a simple animal with a mouth in the middle. It's basically a jellyfish that can't swim. The anemone is a formidable ally to the anemone fish in more ways than one. They use the protection of the anemone to keep their eggs safe, too. The female anemone fish deposits her eggs on the reef under the edge of the anemone. Then her subservient males take over. The males provide all the egg care. The female just sits back and watches. In any group of anemone fish, there's always one anemone fish which is the largest. This is the dominant female. In anemone fish society, the females are the boss. One of the most interesting things about anemone fish is that they're all born male, but as they mature, some will completely transform into females. Only when the dominant female dies will the next male in line get the chance to transform into a female and become the head honcho. Until then, all the smaller anemone fish in the anemone are subservient males. Truth is stranger than fiction, as it turns out, and as my dive comes to an end, I realize that anemone fish are even more fascinating than Hollywood would have us believe. The animals of the ocean truly are remarkable. So another example there uh, for family Pomacentridae. So with that, that's the last family we're going to go over today. So I have a story. And uh, here it is. You learned it here, AEC 441. African cichlid diversity. So we talked about family cichlidae and how it's really one of the most remarkably diverse groups of fishes in both their, their forms and also ecological niches. So some of the most spectacular assemblages of fishes in the world uh, represent radiation through speciation. So one of the best examples of this are the cichlid fishes of the great African riftlix, Malawi, which we saw a video, uh, saw a video on before, um, Tanganyika, and Victoria. Now the rift lakes are deep and large, similar in size to the Laurentian lakes, the Great Lakes of North America. Uh, however, although they're similar in size, the species diversity of the lakes are totally dissimilar. The five Laurentian Great Lakes in North America together contain about two or 235 native or endemic fish species, whereas the African Rift Lakes contain five times that number, more fish species than any other lakes in the world. Now, you know, everyone who's taken intro to biology has heard of Darwin, Char this guy named Charles Darwin, and the finches of the Galapagos Island. Well, the, the, the cichlids of the Rift Lakes are the aquatic equivalent of the finches of Galapagos as far as their diversity. Very rapid, diverse radiation and speciation occurred in a relatively small area in a, sh in a short period of time. So these are the finches of the aqu aquatic realm. So Lake Malawi, for instance, 700 to 1,000 different species of cichlids. Uh, Tanganyika, eight, 180 to 250 species of cichlids. And Lake Victoria has 400 to 500 species of native cichlids. And this is in comparison to our non-cichlid fishes. So you can see that the cichlids dominate these ecosystems. These cichlids have radiated into various species that specialize, again, jaw structures in ecological niches. So again, different feeding apparatus. 
They can feed on plankton, their filter feeders, sponges, detritus, sediment, periphyton, leaves, mollusks, shellfish, benthic arthropods such as insect larvae, crustaceans, zooplankton, fish scales. Some, some cichlids actually have a mouth that's designed to just swim up next to another fish and just literally take a bite out of the side of it, kind of like a cookie cutter shark. They just pull a few scales off and consume those. Other ones will bite the fins. Some actually will attack other fish and eat an eye. I mean, that's like the dinner for, that, that's dinner. Swim by another fish and just eat its eye right off its head. Uh, some will, will, will specialize in eating the eggs and embryos of other fishes. And of course, then there are the, the standard piscivores. They just eat other fish. So major anatomical adaptations associated with different trophic habitats are found on the lips, the oral, the, the, the jaw dentition, the gill rakers, the pharyngeal jaw apparatus inside of the head, the second jaw. And all of these different features have been modified to allow these different groups to operate at an all the different trophic levels within a single ecosystem. So instead of having lots of different groups of organisms doing the same thing, really the cichlids as a family just said, you know what, we're gonna just take care of this whole thing. We're gonna do every single one of those ecological roles. So very amazing, uh, very amazing uh, speciation there. So, uh, you know, when we look at these African rift lakes, here's one of them. This is Lake uh, Victoria here, which borders Rwanda, Kenya, in Uganda, in Tanzania, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the equator runs right through here. The equator runs right through Uganda and, and, and really Lake Victoria. And so uh, I actually, when I was doing uh, work for the USAID Department of State and Aquafish Innovation Labs, I was one of the project directors for Uganda looking at African lungfish, which I showed before. But while we were there, we also then got to go to Lake Victoria. And so here is Entebbe, uh, and then Kampala is the capital of Uganda. And Jinja, I was also in. And so these, these are the major cities here that sort of are on the shore of Lake Victoria in Uganda. And so we look at Lake Victoria here. Here is a shot is a photo of, of Lake Victoria It's a very large lake. And actually these are cages where they're raising fish. They're raising cichlids, tilapias in these floating cages along the shoreline of Lake Victoria. They're farming the, the cichlids from the lake as if, you know, they go out there and harvest them, but they're also farming them there with aquaculture. And this is a pontoon boat then that they use to go out and harvest the fish. This is, this is the fish processing area where they go through and, and sort all the fish by size and put them into baskets then to take them to market. And so these are some of those baskets there piled against this trailer. So here I am uh, on the rail of the pontoon boat going and looking at then the, the cichlids being raised in these floating cages. And this is Lake Victoria. It's, very fan it's a fantastic place, actually. Very interesting. And... Another interesting thing about Lake Victoria is this. Lake Victoria here, there's this little, this little tiny river comes out here and then starts heading north, right here through South Sudan. This little river coming out of Jinja, that is the River Nile. It starts there. So the River Nile originates there out of Lake Victoria. So here's some fantastic grass huts there on the river with the palm trees. Uh, and here it is. This there marks the beginning of the journey of the Nile through the, to the Mediterranean Sea, through central and northern Uganda, South Sudan, Sudan, and then into Egypt, right? One of the bread baskets of the ancient world, ancient human civilizations. And so right outside of here, uh, you know, the, the, the lake itself sort of creates this river, but right outside in here, there's an underground spring, a giant aquifer, and water comes up from that aquifer and feeds into the river. So not only does Lake Victoria supply water to the Nile, which then flows north all the way to the delta into the Mediterranean, but this underwater aquifer, this spring feeds water into 
the Nile as well. So I was there. It's very remarkable. And this is an advertisement for beer. You know, they, I guess they brew beer from the River Nile. But anyhow, this here is then the placard saying that uh, this is welcome to the source of the great River Nile Jinja, Uganda. And so a very awesome place to visit. You know, it's a one in a lifetime kind of thing. And another interesting fact is that when Gandhi, when Mahatma Gandhi died, uh, he was cremated and some of his ashes were spread in the River Nile right there at the source of the River Nile. So the cichlids of the Rift Lakes and their importance to science and also really uh, origins of some of these ancient civilizations. So with that, I'll stop recording here and I will then entertain questions.